Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks, for, thanks for coming. Um, so I've just found out I don't have any, uh, there's no, I can't show any slides today. I'm usually protected from having to remember what I'm going to say next by a rack of about 50 slides. So uh, uh, this is going to be very good for me um, to have to remember what I'm on about. Um, so I've got a couple of notes uh, quickly scribbled. And I'm so glad there's a microphone because I've got a sore throat as well. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to talk mainly from my, my book, There's No Planet B. And uh, why... Just the background to that book. So I've been working around sort of climate change pretty well full time for about 15 years or so. And uh, it's pretty clear if you really want to deal with climate change, it's pretty clear that you have to see climate change uh, as one symptom of something much bigger that's going on. Um, and if we found just a, a sort of a climate change shaped sticky plaster uh, to go over the climate change problem, it wouldn't be long before uh, humans found themselves up against um, a whole load of, uh, you know, a whole load of other, <laughs> other, other problems. <laughs> Maybe this one. <clears throat> Can you hear me all right, by the way? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so, so what is that bigger thing that's going on? And some people call it, have this big word for it, they call it the Anthropocene. And I'm just going to use that word to, descri to describe a, 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 a massive change in context for, in which we're now, humans have to operate now. So, one way of looking at it is that uh, we've been, for a long time now, year after year, humanity has been getting more energy at its disposal. We've been increasing our energy supply. It's been going on for thousands of years, but uh, the rate at which we're increasing our, our, our energy supply has been going up, has been, has been increasing as well. So for the last 50 years, it's been going up by 2.4% a year, which means that's a factor of 10 every century. For the 100 years before that, it was only going up at about 1% per year, and before that at a slower rate. But we've been getting more and more energy. And we use that energy to do all kinds of great things. We use it to travel. We use it to keep warm. We use it to make things. We use it to dig things out of the ground. And we're getting ever more efficient to that energy and ever more inventive in all the things that we can do with it. So we're using it to, uh, we, you know, with, there's ever more chemicals and bombs that we know how to make and all, all this kind of stuff. And one way and another, it, our energy supply and, and our inventiveness with it uh, brings all sorts of great things to our lives, arguably, um, and I'd be dead without some of the technology that we've got. But, um, but through a mixture of accident and design, we increasingly influence the planet that we're living on. And um, that didn't matter, you know, in a way, a long time ago, because we were still a small species on a big, robust planet, and we could get away with treating the world in that way. And until very recently, that was the case. So 100 years ago, we couldn't smash the whole world up, even if we tried. And we did try pretty hard around that time, and we didn't, you know, we didn't succeed. Some, somewhere around 50 years ago, we got to the point where, with a shock, we kind of realized, oh my goodness, you know, we could smash the whole place up if we really did something stupid. But we've got three times more energy at our disposal than we had 50 years ago, and we've invented a lot more things to do with it. And now we're in a completely different context. We're in a context. We're in a situation in which we don't have to be particularly we don't have to be particularly reckless to smash the place up. We are doing, and we will smash the place up unless we are really careful not to. And that's a that's a radically different context for humanity to be operating in. So we, can't, we can no longer get away with treating the world as if we're a small species running around on a big, robust playground. Suddenly, we're in this kind of china shop, and, you know, and our energy supply is going up and up and up, and we're getting increasingly powerful, and we're going to need to be ever more careful about it. And um, so here we are in this Anthropocene. It's a totally different context for humanity to be operating in. And... Yet everything about how we do life and how we run society, how we do our, how we do our politics, how we do our decision making, how we solve our problems, how we run society, how we think, everything has been honed over millennia in a totally different context. So now we've got to urgently ask ourselves how much of how we do life is still fit for purpose and the bits that aren't, we've got to identify them quickly, urgently and uh, even more challenging still, um, we've, got to, uh, we've got to change them. And so here in this Anthropocene, what we're faced with is suddenly a whole range of interconnected, globally systemic challenges. 
Um, so we can't look at climate change over here on its own and then turn our, our attention to biodiversity separately, um, which, by the way, is just as serious as climate change, and then have a look at the food system and ask ourselves how we're going to feed everybody, you know, and then have a look at economics and then have a look at inequality and so on. You know, if we do these things one at a time, it just, it just doesn't work out. It, do, it just doesn't stack up. What we find we actually have to do is we have to have a look at the whole lot all in one go. Um, like it or not. And it doesn't matter how complex you think that is to do, that's what needs to be done. And it's not just the science and the technology and the sort of practical stuff we have to look at. Actually, it turns, um, because it turns out, and here's the good news, if you want a one-line piece of good news from, from There's No Planet B, it turns out that from a technical and scientific point of view, uh, all these problems are happily very solvable. You know, there is no reason why we can't live better than ever before uh, the only thing that's stopping us is is ourselves. We just need to kind of, uh, you know, get our heads around how to how to do it. So the real question, the nub of the question is, well, you know, what is stopping us? What do we have to do? What's what has to change about the economics? What has, what what is it about our values that we need? Um, what is it about you know our politics? What is it about our economics? Well, all these things are inescapably uh, connected into it, and and possibly the crunch point of the whole book, really. Uh, and it's amazing how many. Over the course of writing it, I sat down and talked to a lot of technical experts from all sorts of different fields, and it's amazing how many people would say to me at the end of a uh, sort of at the end of a long cup of coffee would say words to the effect of, "Well, you know what? If we really want to sort all this out, perhaps it all boils down to a values debate. Perhaps it's all about if we've got these values, then it'll all work out fine. And if we can't, if we can't." find a way of having these values like you know similar to these this set over here then we're going to be in trouble whatever we do and i think that's that's exactly where where i came to as well so we'll kind of well, we'll, we'll kind of get on to that so this the book is an attempt to um lay everything all out in in one uh easily accessible not too complex but not too simplistic uh guide to absolutely everything in in one short book <laughs> So if I had my slides at this point, I'd show you a slide of the whole book, every page, all, all at once. And you could see, and it's full of stats and diagrams and so on. And the reason for that is that, uh, you know, I think some numbers can tell you some things, but not everything. But sometimes they, uh, there are some statistics out there that just show you some, that just uh, are mind boggling. They just, you know, they just, they're perspective forcing and they just make you think, ah, oh, how, you know, why are we living like that when we could be living like that? And how much trouble are we going to be in if we carry on living, um, you know, as we do? And how much opportunity is there um, to do things, you know, so much better than, than we are? So that's kind of by way of uh, introduction to the book. Um, so some of, the, some of the detail that's in it. So the first 50 pages or so are all about the food system. And this is based on work that we did at, at Lancaster. And just to, I would show a lovely diagram of all this, but just to, just to show you, just to describe it, what you would have. Um, so just if you look at, to start with, look, we, so we looked at all the, all the essential, human essential nutrients on their journey from field to fork uh, and other endpoints. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wasn't even thinking of that. Um, and... Uh, and uh, just to see how, at the global level and also at the, at the regional level as well, just to see how much of it there was and, and where they all went and why anybody, you know, what it would take for, to have a world in which everybody got all the nutrition they want. So just to start with looking at the calories, but we looked at other things too and got a very similar story. So at the global level, we grow, humans grow, nearly 6,000 calories of human edible food per day for everyone in the world. That's something like two and a half times what we need to eat. Isn't that fantastic? What a brilliant surplus. And as well as that, our, our farm animals also eat about 4,000 calories worth of grass and pasture that we can't eat, but it's kind of another energy source. So if you were to add the two together, that'd be 10,000 calories per person per, per day, but 6,000 human edible calories. And then a little bit gets lost in harvesting and a little bit gets lost in storage, and those are maybe maybe 600 calories per person per day between those two, those two losses. And that's you know that's um, something we can do something about. We could perhaps cut it in half. It's hard to get it to zero, but we can do a lot to change that. But there's still absolutely plenty. 
So uh, where does it all go, really? So the crunch point is when we've got all this food and we work the human edible crops and we work out what to do with it. And the first thing is that a little bit gets saved as seeds so we can plant crops next year as well. And that's a very good idea, but that's a, like a tiny fraction. About 800 calories per person per day goes into non-food uses. Some of that is plastics, but most of it is biofuel. And um, that's not necessarily bad uh, as such. But just to give you an idea of the trade-off between food and biofuel, I drive a little um, Citroen C1 one-litre car. It does, it, I can get 70 miles to the gallon out of it if I'm careful. And uh, if I were to get enough wheat to give me all the calories I need for a day, but instead use that wheat to make biofuel to power that car, I could power that car for one mile. Right? So that's a day's worth of food, against one mile in a small car. That's an incredibly steep trade-off. Now, you can do a second-generation biofuel in which you don't grow a human edible crop. You grow, a, a, you grow something like a cellulose crop instead, and you can maybe get it up to five miles, but it's still an incredibly steep trade-off. So the point I'm making here is that in the, in the low-carbon, sustainable world in which we're feeding nine or 10 billion people, um, we've got to be really, really careful that we're... Um, that we're not letting market forces push the food supply into biofuel because it will be so badly at the expense of both our biodiversity and everybody getting enough to eat. So that's the kind of biofuel story that we need to really keep an eye on. But the biggest story in, in, in all of this is that um, about 1,750 calories of human edible food per person per day gets fed to our farm animals on top of the grass that they eat. So that's nearly three quarters of all the energy, all the food energy that we need as humans getting fed to our farm an animals. They eat all, the, all that grass as well, and they give us back about 600 calories. So there's an incredible inefficiency there. It's something like a factor of 10 in the energy in to a farm animal to, to the energy out uh, uh, gets lost. And so there's no getting around it from the point of view of uh, creating space in, our, in the land system to be able to manage our biodiversity properly, from the point of view of being able to feed the world, and definitely from a greenhouse gas point of view, it's absolutely critical that we cut down massively on the feeding of human edible food to farm animals. Um, and arguably on, on cut down on farm animals um, you know, altogether, e even the pasture uh, even even those eating pasture, because uh, we need to uh, also deal with our biodiversity system. I'm not a vegan, by the way, or or, or even a, a vegetarian, but I do think it's all about the proportions. We need to cut the proportions. So, okay, after that, you know, huge inefficiency of, of having animals in the food system, um, or animals eating human edible food in the food system. We've still got some other losses along the way, including household losses. And in this country, they're, they're pretty big. Um, in, in Africa, they're not very much at all. But um, there's, still, uh, you know, there's still enough to go around. In fact, there's a surplus, because on average, we eat a little bit more than we need to at, at the global level. So what does this, what does this tell us? So the, the, the big, and you can, I've, I've said this for, I've just talked you through the calories, but actually if you look at this from the point of view of protein or iron or zinc or any of the critical human essential nutrients, you get exactly the same story. So what does this tell us? It tells us we, what I've just said about the farm animals. It tells us we need to watch biofuels like crazy. It tells us that actually we don't need, if you, if you just take out for a moment, the effects of climate change making our land system less able to produce food. If you just ignore that for the moment, existing technologies and practices would be enough to feed a population of 10 billion if we could just make the dietary change and, and cut our waste down. Uh, waste is the second most important story uh, in this. It's, the dietary change is the biggest thing, cutting waste is the second most, uh, and then the biofuels. But it also there's also something else that comes out of this for me, which is that Actually, we already have enough food in, of every nutrient in the world for everybody to have enough. So we could double the food supply, actually, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't create the situation in which everybody still has access to a, balance, to, a, to a healthy, balanced diet. And why is that? That's because in a market economy, the truth of it is the supply chain can't be bothered to find its way to every mouth because not every mouth has enough money to make it financially worthwhile for the supply chain to find its way there. So unless we sort that end of the debate out, if we, if we care about everybody having access to 
uh, a healthy diet, then actually we have to sort out the inequality debate because at the end of the day, if there's a crop growing some food, um, growing something, and there's a choice between it can go this way towards, let's say, bio jet, biofuel to power a private jet for somebody who's a thousand or a million times richer than somebody over here who knows if they don't get access to the food, they'll die young, then actually in the market, you know, if you don't do something to con to uh, change the market economy, the food will go off to, to for the biofuel to the private jet rather than the person who really needs it. Okay, so that's a, a bit about the food system. There's a little bit about fish in there as well, which also kind of has a role, but we need to watch it really carefully. I'll just, just quickly on population, because some people... So I'm just going to give a smattering of stuff from, from the book. Um, I can't possibly go into everything that's in it, but population definitely deserves um, a mention. So, you know, it's clearly a really important dimension uh, of the whole thing. So, uh, but it's not quite the single issue that some people frame it up as. So it's absolutely um, true to say that you know, 12 billion people are going to find it harder to live on this beautiful, fragile planet A that we're on than 1 billion people would find, um, would find it. But on the other hand, 1 billion careless people uh, will trash the place in no time at all, right? We, we are so, such a powerful species now that, um, you know, it's, uh, even a small number of us can smash the whole place up. And yet, a large number of really careful people um, you know, could could just snuggle up and you know live carefully and and live well together on on this place, but the fewer of us, there's no doubt about it. The fewer of us there are, the easier it's going to be. So there is kind of a you know there is an inescapably a thing about you know how can we um, get that population to, global population growth to um, to plateau uh, as soon as possible, and the keys to it turn out to be. Um, you know, the sort of best evidence on this turns out to be that actually it's about uh, it's about education and it's about dealing with inequality and it's about human rights and it's about giving people access to proper choices about how many kids they have, and um, you know, so it ties in with a lot of other things that are you know really good to do and also really essential to do if you want to if you want to deal with climate change. Okay. I haven't talked about climate change um, specifically yet. I better get onto that. Um, so, just um, I won't do the whole sort of story from from scratch on it. But just to say, the one point five degrees that people talk about. I mean, we talk about you know, um, you know, do we do we know for sure that one point five degrees is is going to be okay? Because we used to talk about two degrees, and and now people are saying, well, you know, we, we we've got twelve years to sort ourselves out it's to live within one point five degrees, and then we'll be fine. And uh, David Attenborough rounded it down to to a decade. Um, but the truth of it is that there's a lot of scientific uncertainty around all of this stuff. And when when we used to talk about two degrees, that was because the kind of a load of scientists got together very carefully, and at the end of the day, they were just kind of trying to assess the risks like this, and they came down to the idea that two degrees was kind of you know seemed like an acceptable level of risk. And as the science has moved on and as and uh, and improved, and our understanding of it has got a bit better, the same kind of analysis has taken us to the point where the same scientists are saying, actually, 1.5 degrees looks a bit scarier than we used to think 2 degrees was. So there's really, really no messing around over that 1.5 degrees. But just to say, actually, there's an awful lot of uncertainty in this. So we don't actually know whether or not we've crossed a point at which we've already triggered a whole kind of um, feedback mechanism that uh, might mean that... Uh, we're already unable to contain climate change to the point at which it's catastrophic for billions of people rather than the millions of people that it's catastrophic for at the moment. Um, we, we, we simply don't know. It's kind of, if you want to be realistic about this, we're just playing around with a whole load of uncertainty that we haven't got a clue about. Just to quickly give you an idea about that. I'm not trying to be a gloom number, by the way. This is a, a gloom monger. This is an optimistic book. Lots of people tell me this is an optimistic book. Um, but uh, just to give you an idea about it, so, you know, it only takes, if you take a rice crop up to 33 degrees for about three days at the wrong time of year, uh, you know, you it has a catastrophic effect on that, 
on that harvest. And if you contemplate, you know, what it would do to the sort of global food markets if that happened, and what that would do to global could do to global stability, you know, it doesn't take you long before you're suddenly realizing that actually, you know, something like that could um, affect us, you know, really hard and really quickly. And we're at risk of that. Um, every year, I was talking to David King about that. You know, he, he, the risks of that happening right now are actually significant. And equally, we've got things about me methane exploding up in, in the Antarctic and forest fires that we're hearing about. And we just don't know whether any of this stuff is is has triggered a feedback mechanism that we now can't contain. But there's a very good chance that we can contain it. So you know, there's everything to play for. But the point I'm trying to make is that when people use that term "climate emergency" instead of "climate change," actually, it's an entirely appropriate phrase to be using. This is absolutely an emergency that we're in. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, and and just on climate change, so we need to leave the fossil fuel in the ground and we need to we need to cut our carbon emissions and just I just want to make this point about where we're up to at the moment about it. If you look at the carbon emissions curve, it's going up exponentially and there is not any trace, and again, I'd show you this on a lovely slide, but there's not any trace at all of evidence that that curve has shown any kind of a dent because humans have noticed climate change, right? It's going up exactly, and I am choosing my words carefully, it is going up exactly as if humans had never noticed that climate change was an issue. So and I'm, I'm not saying this to be depressing because that Acknowledging that tells us a lot about what won't solve the problem, but it tells us, puts us a lot hotter on the case as to what the kind of thing that might solve the problem. So um, why are we getting no progress at the global level when we all know, that, you know, I'm sure in this tent there are now loads of people who are, me included, who are you know, doing at least some actions to cut their carbon footprint. And there are nations that have got targets and businesses that have got targets and all the rest of it. You know, how come we're not seeing any dent at all? And the reason is that at the global system level, all the kind of small changes you get in odd places um, with individuals or, or single countries just get absorbed. The rest of the system kind of absorb, just kind of takes up the slack. And we keep on this exponential for kind of reasons that I explain in a bit more detail in the book. Uh, so we, what, what this tells us is we have to have global systemic change. We have to have that. Nothing else will do. So people say, well, what's the point in an individual doing anything about it? If I want to help, you know, how can I possibly help when it's also global and systemic? And it's a really valid, it's a really valid question. And the good news is that there's absolutely plenty we can all, we can and should all be doing. Um, and personal action does have does have a massive role in that. Um, but we need to think about it all slightly differently. So we need to think about it in terms of what can I do to help create the conditions under which the global systemic change that we need to see urgently becomes possible. And um, so part of that is about, you know, it is about how we live and it is about our personal lives. And it's not about beating ourselves up for the things that we're imperfect about because we're all hopelessly conflicted. You can't live in this society without being. Uh, but it is about not letting ourselves off the hook and trying to move forward, you know, as we can. And by doing so, we, we, we become role models, we demonstrate what's possible as best we can. And also, by our own kind of personal experience of it, we, we kind of, uh, we learn about the whole global issue as well, because the parallels between the you know, the small scale and the big scale are, are massive. So, so there's a kind of personal living side of it. But then the, real, the other question is, so what are all the other things that, uh, that I can do? How else can I exert my influence to get that systemic change? And that's about doing it, um, that, that's about everywhere you can think of. And I know straight after me, there's going to be the people at Preston New, from Preston New Road who've been campaigning against fracking, so they're doing it their way. And I know Extinction Rebellion are here, and there's even some... Thank you very much. Brilliant. So, you know, is it time to take to the streets? Probably yes. In fact, absolutely yes. So long as that's done in a really careful and um, a, a really careful and thoughtful way. And I'll just say about Extinction Rebellion, I absolutely take my hats off to them. I think they've been fantastic the way they've... I wasn't sure what I'd... I, to be truthful, I wasn't quite sure what I'd sort of think about the way they went about the protests in April. And I came back uh, incredibly impressed from all that. I mean, I, I think they are absolutely... Um, we shouldn't pin everything on Extinction Rebellion alone, but, you know, they are doing a fantastic, um, a fantastic job. So 
but there's all the other ways in which we can exert that influence. So it's about, so every time we spend money, for example, that's an opportunity to push for one future um, or another. Uh, so, you know, I know it's hard to uh, single-handedly switch your pension scheme. We've, I've run a small business and we've been trying to get our, all the fossil fuel out of the company pension scheme. And you wouldn't believe what a difficult exercise that's been. We finally found a fossil fuel-free pension scheme. Um, so it's, and it, but it's, you know, if you're a teacher, it's how do you influence your kids? If you're, if you go to school or you go to a university, you know, what influence do you have on that institution? It's all that if you go to work, how does, you know, what influence do you have on the way that, um, that workplace operates? And I talked just to, just to sort of try and complete the picture a little bit about, um, some of the other areas in which we need to see change. So it's unsurprising that our economics, uh, absolutely, uh, has to change completely um, because it was it comes out from a different era and so I'll stop talking in just a in just a second and, and give some time for some questions but so the whole question about growth um, I don't think necessarily we need to say growth is net economic growth is necessarily inherently something we absolutely can't have but I will say that growth of most things and definitely our energy supply has to stop and in terms of GDP growth, it is going hand in hand with uh, rising environmental impacts. And at very best, it's an irrelevance. And we're just chasing the wrong metrics. You know, we need metrics that are all about the health of people and planet. Uh, in terms of reworking our economics, you know, the whole notion of what a business is in the here in the Anthropocene, there's no, uh, you know, a business needs to exist primarily to be helpful to people and planet and not to make money. And that has to be how every business sees itself. And the same goes for any job. Any job has to primarily exist for health of people and planet, including the person who does the job, of course. Um, but it's, you know, we need to completely reframe how we think um, about all of that. And I haven't talked much about it, inequality yet, but it features pretty strongly in the book. If you look closely at climate change, just from a just from a pragmatic point of view, it looks almost impossible to broker the kind of global deals that we need without dealing with um, the inequality that's growing around the world. That absolutely, uh, because like it or not now, here on this planet A, we are all in it together, whether we want to think like that or not. You know, we absolutely have to. Um, we actually ha absolutely have to treat each other with uh, equal respect now. And so that I'm just going to finish by talking about um, the values section of the book, which is just incredibly simple. And, you know, I don't, um, I don't have any credentials for talking about, you know, what values are, uh, you know, we should all adopt um, other than just by looking at this from a purely pragmatic point of view, right? That's the only position I'm taking on this. What kind of values will, he, will allow humans to thrive in the Anthropocene and what values will get in the way of that? And I think it boils down to about three really essential values. And luckily it turns out, and there's plenty of evidence, that we can, through our deliberate effort, cultivate these values and make them culturally normal. And the first one is just dead obvious. It's just that to treat every human being uh, with equal respect and as if they have equal value in, inherently as humans. Um, and the second one is to extend that to all the other species so that we don't just treat them as servants to humanity, but we treat them as species of value in their own right. And... <laughs> I missed that. Um, and the third one and there's a whole chapter on this in the book, uh, is about truth. So uh, we're in a world in which the complexity of everything is going up. And if we're going to deal with it, we need the clearest view of the truth that we can possibly get. And we're also, because of the complexity going up, it's also easier than ever for uh, truth to get deliberately or accidentally disguised. And so we're seeing things going in the wrong direction, and we need to see things absolutely going hard in the right direction. So... Um, and I would show a whole load of a slide of a whole load of faces of political figures and ask us. We need to ask really, really carefully, you know, which one of these is doing the best job they possibly can of um, of putting us uh, of of telling us, giving us the best view of the truth that they are able to do. And there's a whole, you know, there's a whole lot of action that we can all do about being increasingly discerning and increasingly critical over our thinking uh, about, you know 
having well-founded bases for working out what to trust, when to trust, and, and, when not, uh, and, and who not to trust, and what to do when we're not happy with the trustworthiness um, of our politicians or our, or our information sources. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there, but just to emphasize one point, which is just that, you know, this is not... Um, we are heading for a lot of trouble, possibly quite soon, if we don't radically change the way that we go about things. But on the other hand, if we do, and we can, and it's absolutely not proven that we can't, then we, do, we seriously do have the opportunity to live better than ever before. So there's absolutely everything to play for. We need to see big system change, and systems sometimes do change very, very quickly. And it's, you know, we're in an interesting moment now. People have got more energy you know, there's more energy for that change, dramatically more energy for it than there was even 12 months ago. It's nowhere near enough yet, but uh, there's no telling how if we all push hard, you know, this could be the moment at which we really can make that, that big system flip. So thank you. For